Hi, and welcome to our video on inheritance patterns. And I figured I'd start this off with royalty, because why not? And so we were starting here with Queen Victoria, who it turns out was a carrier of the gene for hemophilia, which wasn't a big deal for her. Hemophilia is an X-linked recessive trait, and she had one version of the gene. So she did not have hemophilia, which of course is a disease where your blood does not clot normally. Not a big deal for her, kind of a big deal for a bunch of her descendants. And so this is her family tree. And you can see these are her offspring and their offspring and their offspring. And everybody who is outlined in red here is has hemophilia. So um, you can see that most of them did not live to ripe old ages. In, in the case of Prince Friedrich of Hesse and by Rhine, uh, he lived for three years. It was a pretty tough, pretty tough situation there. Um, but that's of totally a function of how hemophilia was inherited by this family. Of course, these days hemophilia is treated through injections of the clotting factors that are needed so that your blood will clot. And this is done through recombinant biotechnology. And we'll talk more about that down the road a piece. But in this video, we're going to look at common inheritance patterns. And we're going to talk a little bit about karyotype analysis and the role that the environment plays in heritability, which we really haven't talked about too much up to this point, but we really should pay attention to. So cool. We're gonna look at a couple of different um, inheritance patterns and really to get a handle on this, generally what we're looking at are pedigrees. So the way that pedigrees work, squares are males and circles are females. And yet, generally speaking, it will be shaded in to be affected or not. If you're not affected, uh, what I've done here is I've made the affected red and the unaffected blue because I like colors, but that's pretty much the way it works. And when we look at a pedigree, we talk about the generations. They are the rows and you may number the individuals or not to help to talk about them, but this is the way that we read a pedigree when we go through this. Cool? Nice. So let's go through and let's talk about a couple. So first we're gonna look at autosomal dominant traits. So when we look at an autosomal dominant trait, the way that we know that it's inherited autosomal dominant is because you always have affected offspring having at least one affected parent. If we look at this in our pedigree form, this is an autosomal dominant inheritance pedigree. Just one, one example, just something we can do. I've gone, I'll go through and I'll put the letters in so that you can see what's happening here. And you can see that you never have an affected offspring who doesn't have at least one affected parent. That's sort of the, the, the key clue that you need to help you decide whether or not a trait is being inherited on an autosomal dominant basis. Uh, as an example of an autosomal dominant basis, we've got Peter Dinklage, famous American actor who has a chondroplastic dwarfism, which is a very common type of dwarfism, and it is inherited as an autosomal dominant condition. Uh, it's actually, if you get two copies of the allele for it, uh, the offspring does not survive to be born. So it's actually what we'd call a lethal allele situation. And so heterozygous will always have a chondroplastic dwarfism. And th this means that one of Peter Dinklage's parents had to have a chondroplastic dwarfism. Um, now, if he has a child, it doesn't necessarily mean that the child will have a chondroplastic dwarfism. They may or may not, depending upon the alleles in uh, Mrs. Dinklage and how they segregate during meiosis and then combine during fertilization. Moving on, we've got autosomal recessive traits. Autosomal recessive traits, sort of the, the key thing to look for here is that you can have affected offspring from unaffected parents because those parents can be carriers and not show the traits. So here we have a pedigree for this. And what we've done here is we've shaded in half red, half blue, the, the carriers for the traits. Here are the genotypes for each offspring in the trait. And you can see in, in generation two in the male who is all the way to the right, that he has the trait, even though his parents didn't, they were just carriers. That's a, a dead giveaway that we're probably looking at a recessive trait and it could very well be an autosomal recessive trait. As an example of an autosomal recessive characteristic, we've got phenylketonuria, which is also known as PKU. This is an inability to break down phenylalanine. And the reason that this is autosomal recessive is because you need enzymes to do this. And so if you are heterozygous, you will have defective enzymes, but you'll also have from the other parent, the enzymes that will allow you to do this. So you won't have PKU because even though one set of your enzymes, it does not do this, the other set takes care of that and makes up for it. You have to be recessive in order to have PKU because you need to have both sets of enzymes be defective in order not to be able to have the trait. And so this is a, a big deal because it has to be modified by diet. If you ever look on the back of certain things, you may see like attention phenylketonurics contains phenylalanine. 
phenylketonurics are people who have uh, phenylketonuria and they can't eat foods with phenylalanine because they have no way of breaking it down and it will actually build up in cells because there's no way to break it down. And as a result, that can lead to all sorts of physiological problems and can even affect cognitive function and things like that. So this infant is being tested for PKU to see if they have it, if they're a carrier or what, because various dietary modifications need to be made almost immediately if they do have PKU. The last mode of inheritance that we're going to look at is the X-linked recessive mode. It's going to look very similar to an autosomal recessive mode, but generally speaking, we're going to see more affected males than females. Um, and affected females, females who have both copies of the X-linked recessive allele, can only produce affected sons. They can never produce an unaffected son because the son is getting its X chromosome from his mom. Sometimes it may be difficult to determine whether or not a trait on a pedigree is X-linked recessive or autosomal recessive. But generally speaking, if you're being asked to do that, it, there should be a clear evidence that it's one and not the other. Let's take a look at this pedigree and we'll go in and we'll put in the genotypes of everybody who's present. And you can see that in our first generation, we have an affected male and a carrier female, which means that we're actually getting some affected females in the second generation. And I did that on purpose. It's important to understand that just because a trait is X-linked recessive doesn't mean that the recessive condition will only show up in males and not females ever. It just means that it's more likely to show up in males because males only have one copy of the X chromosome. Our example for our X-linked uh, condition is red-green color blindness. So what we have on the top right up here is a color blindness test. This is a test where it is very difficult for people who have red-green color blindness to see the numbers that are inside of the circle. Uh, if you want to take a guess as to what the numbers are inside the circle, feel free to leave it in the comments below the video. If you want to ruin it for everybody else, if you can't see numbers inside the circle, I would check the resolution of your screen before concluding whether or not you actually have red-green color blindness. Um, this is not a medical video or a diagnostic video by any stretch, so please consult your medical personnel of choice. We also see uh, two pictures, and the picture on the right has been simulated so that those of us who don't have red-green color blindness can get some understanding of what the world looks like if you have red-green color blindness. Though, of course, asking one person what they see is a notoriously difficult question. When we're investigating human inheritance, a lot of times we're going to be interested in the karyotype of the organism. And karyotype is a picture of the chromosomes that are present in the organism. What you need to do is isolate cells that are in metaphase, so the chromosomes are present. And these are usually isolated from the fetus in order to see if there's any chromosomal abnormalities in the fetus before the fetus is born. This is a normal human male karyotype, and we know it's a male because we have an X and a Y chromosome down at the bottom right of the diagram. If it was a female, we'd have two X chromosomes. Here we see a typical human female karyotype. Well, actually both in this case, right? They show you the two different examples. And then you see, an ex and then you see one where you have three copies of chromosome 21. That's referred to as a trisomy. That, pre that suffix somy means chromosomes and tri means three. So we have three chromosome 21s. This is a condition known as Down syndrome, which is actually really the only condition where you have an extra non-sex chromosome that can really be tolerated by the human organism. Um, there are a couple of other examples of trisomies where the baby may be born, but the baby will not live for very long thereafter. Having an extra chromosome is detrimental to the organism. Your physiology has, e has very much evolved to have two copies of each chromosome. And to throw an extra one in there starts to have all sorts of really complicated network effects that complicate things. And so having an extra chromosome in there makes it somewhat more difficult to have a, what we would say is a typical physiology. Finally, before we wrap up, we should really pay attention to the role of the environment in determining traits, right? So of course, DNA goes to RNA and the instructions in RNA go to proteins and pr the actions of proteins lead to traits. But the environment plays a really big role in the expression of traits as well. And I think, you know, we really do need to give it its due in terms of how, just how important the environment is in leading to the traits that an organism has. Uh, one of the analogies I've often heard is if the DNA is sort of like the recipe for baking a cake and the protein is the ingredients, you could think about the environment as the oven in which you actually bake the cake. It's, it's a pretty big deal, in other words, in terms of leading to the traits that organisms have. I'll give you a couple of examples. So for instance, in reptiles, the gender of reptiles, many reptiles is determined based upon the temperature at which the eggs develop. So it's not X or Y based. It's only based upon what the temperature was at the sort of critical moment during reptile development that leads to the particular gender that the organism has. That's a 
pretty significant difference that's totally dependent upon the environment. Similar to that, we can see seasonal changes in an organism. So we can see changes in gene expression over the span of a season. So this is an Arctic hare with its white winter coat and then its browner summer coat. So it's changing the pigmentation that it expresses as a function of the season that it's in and the environmental conditions that are present in that season. And of course we see that in humans as well through things like the tanning response. Um, when you're exposed to ultraviolet light, you will your skin will darken and produce more melanin as a result. You could certainly see this in many other instances as well. And this is just a really good opportunity to pay attention and note that certainly your genes are an important part of your inheritance but the environment that you live in is an equally important part of contributing to the traits that the organism expresses. Thanks so much for watching this video on inheritance. Make sure you can do the following things here at the end. Make sure you can determine the likely mode of inheritance for a trait if you're given a pedigree. Interpret a karyotype to determine autosomes, sex chromosomes, gender, and possible genetic conditions that the organism may have. And finally, explain the role that the environment plays in contributing to gene expression. If you can do all those things, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment and write down any questions that you have so that you can get the answers that you need. Thanks so much for watching this video. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.